In the 16th century, art had philosophical business to do. It gave form to ideas it had issues to define. An obsession with God, death, and the devil emerged from the Dark Ages and continued to inform the European imagination, even as the Renaissance was becoming established. Hieronymus Bosch was the last great master of the medieval world before it ultimately petered out. Bosch was the hellfire and pitchfork evangelist of late medieval art, his horrific visions and grim allegories populated by devils and monsters defined the fanatical Christianity of provincial Northern Europe. At the same time, Renaissance Italian humanism, the idea that man is the measure of all things and the center of creation had become all the rage in the sunny South. Suddenly human beings were no longer smelly carcasses corrupted by sin. They became the muscular sons of God, ideal, rational, ethical. But Peter Bruegel would have none of it. He stands on the shoulders of Bosch, and for anybody looking at Bruegel's Mad Meg, seen here, that much is certain. It's an old Flemish folk tale about a washerwoman who lays siege to hell with an army of hags. Hellfire glows like hot coals in a slag heap. It's a Mephisto waltz of hideously deformed monstrosities, devils and demons, straight out of a gothic night terror. And yet, while Bosch is medieval as a witch hunt, Bruegel is not really a man of the Dark Ages. He emerges from the Dark Ages, but his ideas are not really the same. A sly, understated humor informs the diabolical madcaps of Bruegel. It's as though he's hamming it up for the yokels while he winks at the rest of us with his other eye. Bosch is dour, haunted, humorless as the tax man. Bosch condemns the human race with fire and torture. Humanity is oafish, corrupt, ugly, rotten with sin. Bosch is the hanging judge of late medieval painting. Those who knew Bruegel called him Bruegel the Droll, or of the dry wit. But like most great humorists, his wit had a tragic edge. And later in life, Bruegel reveals himself to be far more than the peasant jester the old critics took him for. He was, in fact, arguably the greatest philosopher in art the world would ever see. He went to Rome all right in the mid-16th century, uh, Italy was graduate school. But when his fellow northerners were all running back home with bloated arist aristocratic ideals and goofy gestures stolen from the Italian fashion glossies, as seen here, Bruegel thumbed his nose at the Italian humanist club and its latest affectation called mannerism. Bruegel was contemptuous of artificial grace and waxy idealization, thought they were petty conceits. Italy bored him. Indeed, Italian humanism had become a, a courtly affectation. He paid a price for trashing Italy. He was consigned to the second rank all of his life, but he didn't care. He sold pictures all the same, and he made a decent living. Bruegel was a humanist all right, but he wasn't going to be a humanist by making up a lot of lofty foo-foo. He was going to be a humanist by telling the truth. He had no illusions about human nature, but he was nearly always in sympathy with mankind's burdens and travails and lumbering attempts to make things work, in spite of everything God and nature could throw at him. Bruegel identified with the peasant. He never painted a nobleman in his life except as a bit player. He understood the peasant's simple, unpretentious desires and appetites and pleasures, his hard work, his clumsy piety, and his common sense. And as we see in this detail, his sympathy rejects the Italian take on man as the idealized measure of all things. And here we see Bruegel's clumsy clodhoppers in the peasant dance of 1567, 
taking a lusty break from what was certainly a brutally hard and short life, defined by rotten teeth, fatal illness, infant mortality, and worse. All the same, they throw themselves three quarters drunk into a spirited estampé, living 100% for a jug of spirits and a moment's physical pleasure. Heavy, earthbound, real, they can take the worst of it and still dance like they mean it. For my money, Bruegel's lusty bumpkins, who dance as hard as they work, say far more about the human condition than Michelangelo's much ballyhooed flying muscle men. Or Raphael's sugar-glazed Madonnas. Baby Jesus in this example looks unintentionally goofy. Was Bruegel a peasant himself? No. He was well-traveled. He had Latin school education. His friends and collectors were the most respected intellectuals in Antwerp. It's very unlikely that they would have put up with a hayseed. Mainly, he was known as a peasant painter, a subject now called genre painting, that is, country folks, ma and pa kettle down on the farm, that sort of thing. It's a subject he all but invented. His portfolio of subjects was deep and rich and rather unpredictable, and his take on any given thing was so original as to be revolutionary. He was a pioneer of dedicated landscape painting at a time when landscape was considered little more than a, a backdrop. No one ever rendered air and distance with more visionary grandeur than, Bru than Bruegel. His allegories are clever and pithy, such as this darkly humored rendition of the blind leading the blind. And he could even turn out a history painting such as this Tower of Babel with sweep and imagination. Bruegel fuses all of this together into what was perhaps his greatest imaginative work, the grim B side of the peasant dance. It's a dance of death, or more to the point, the triumph of death, painted in 1562. It's sort of a landscape, all right, but this landscape is as burnt and barren as the no man's land between two enemy trenches. A vast, numberless army of bones pours out of the earth like a tsunami and washes over all of humanity. This is death at high tide. Kings, beggars, peasants, soldiers, fishwives, all of them are frog-marched into this great coffin from which there is no escape and no return. A fool hides under a table. A nobleman draws his sword. All are doomed just the same. A sweeping overall composition unifies literally hundreds of narrative elements. A king offers up his gold but the Grim Reaper laughs off the tribute. There is no way out, no hope, no redemption, no reward. And it is all the same for everyone. All iniquity of class, wealth, cleverness, strength, or beauty is at last leveled and vanquished by the common inevitability of death. Go ahead, says Bruegel, talk up your lofty ideas and noble conceits about man the measure of all things, so noble in thought, so graceful in aspect. In the end, it still comes to this. A parade of corpses in white shrouds stand at attention behind a cross for some final call that doesn't seem to come. Even God has deserted this place. Ships at sea an old symbol for souls on a voyage through life explode into fire. All hands are lost. This is the reckoning that every human being must come to, and Bruegel contemplates the bleak finality of doom without so much as a breath of hope. His fatalism is more like that of the ancient Greek philosopher who hates and fears death, but looks it straight in the eye. Bruegel is most like Bosch at this moment, and yet, 
with one very crucial difference. Bruegel sides with humanity. He feels for these poor, terrified souls. Bosch, as seen in this detail, never does. Humanity has it coming. Bruegel stands the medieval idea on its head. In other contemporary depictions of death, well, death is neither good nor evil. He just does his job with, with little malice. Sometimes he's almost jolly. In this story, death is the heavy. Death is the murderer, the cruel soldier, the robber who cuts your throat. Humanity, for its part, is terrified, hopeless, pathetic, and doomed. This is not some rhetorical ballet that flatters us into thinking we are something better than we are. This is, this is a tragic assessment of who and what we really are. Bruegel dumps a bucket of ice on our complacency. <laughs>